All right. Any questions, comments, concerns? Phil. Oh, I hope you have the lab from yesterday here. That's not due next Monday. No. No, it's going to be part. You're going to combine it with the work from uh, last week as you, we start building up this bigger report. Okay. So there's no lab to do No, not next week. <laughs> but I sure hope you've got it here. Actually, you don't need to because uh, uh, I have the very same data, so I've worked it up, so we're going to be able to talk about it here. But if you've got it, break it out because that's what we're going to look at today. So far, we spent the first part of the term looking at what we call rectilinear motion. That was the one-dimensional motion we started with. And that's where we introduced the concept of, of position and velocity came from that. We looked at both average and instantaneous velocities. And then we took the step to acceleration Look at both average and instantaneous acceleration. Um, now we're looking at curvilinear motion. And we started a, a sort of a, a touch on that on, um, on Monday when we started looking at vectors, because that's a, a full two dimensional representation of what's going on. A vector is very, very good for any parts of that we need. Uh, whether it's the position, um, just simply as uh, x, y coordinates uh, representing the, or uh, that helps us have then the, the length of the vector and its direction. And of course, whatever the length is, uh, there's got to be units with it. Um, but then we also uh, do the very same type of thing that we did with it in terms of velocity and Acceleration. So we, we introduced this idea uh, of, a, of a position vector on, on uh, Monday. And we looked at it, well, there's, there's different ways you can represent it. The, the main way we did on Monday was we just simply talked about the two orthogonal components, the two vectors, one horizontal, one vertical, that we could add together and have the very, very same thing. And this is very much like you would have done for a little trip across town to your friend's house. You wouldn't cut straight across all the yards. You'd first go somewhere down Elm and then up on Main, and that's how you get there. That's exactly what we mean in these two instances. This is simply a, uh, you could call it, I guess, an analytical representation of this very simple idea. The reason that's useful to us is as we go to add vectors together, it's much easier for us if we add them together. It's much more accurate if we add them together by adding up all the R parts of all the vectors we might have to make up the X part of the whatever the resultant might be. So if we've got a couple vectors in here we're going to add together. And we did this very thing on Monday uh, with one of the homework problems, only I think I called the vectors A, B, and C at that time. But we can call them R1, R2, and there can be however many there might be. And we want to know what the resultant of all those vectors being added together would be. Don't forget they could be subtracted, too. Uh, a subtraction is just sort of an addition backwards. And so we added up all those little vectors. Is everybody familiar with this summation sign notation? It's going to be real important to us. We don't do anything more with it than just that. It's just our symbol that says, add up all these things that we've got in this problem. In this problem, we're talking about all these different position vectors we might be adding up, whatever they all might do. We 
we had a we had a, a problem on uh, Monday that had happened to have three vectors. Then one of the homework problems that follows had a few more vectors in it. Doesn't matter. However many there are, we can add them all up. And the easy part of it is for us, especially since we all know trigonometry, is we can take any vector, break it into its orthogonal components, add up the components themselves, and that will give us the resultant vector. The only thing I'm going to add here is an extra, uh, a slightly different notation that we might use. I can write it as I've shown here. We also have another way to write vectors. Remember, all vectors have magnitude in units. That'd be whatever number appears here um, as, the, uh, as the, the size, the distance in the x or the y direction we're going. Also, though, all vectors have direction. So one way we can write this is just whatever the magnitude is, notice the vector sign's not on the top anymore. But you're all probably screaming inside because this, this offends us. Aren't are you feeling it? Who's, who's feeling offended out there? Joey is, yeah. Len can't stand. Phil's just, just, ugh, you're just dying to come up here and, and fix things. Why, what's wrong? What's wrong is I said a vector equals something that isn't a vector. There's no direction in here other than the subscripts, but if I just end up putting some numbers in there, like, a, like three miles and six miles, Where's the direction part of that? So I need some direction to complete this, this as a full vector representation. So what we do is this simple idea of what we call unit vectors. They're extremely useful to us as a, as a notational key. It's the only vector you'll ever see that has direction, magnitude, and no units. Its magnitude is 1. 1, nothing. Just 1. A magnitude of 1. It's kind of like the sine and the cosine and the tangent and all that stuff. That uh, Those never have units on them. Those are just uh, just uh, uh, distances, uh, uh, but in comparison to a unit circle, if you remember how you first learned trigonometry, but there was never units on it. No cosine that you ever take will have units on it itself. And they give us direction in a particular way. We're going to have three unit vectors we use in this class. The first will be a unit vector in the x direction. And we call it i hat. So I'll put that just after that rx thing. Now I'll have, if I had numbers in here, I'd have magnitude, units. Now I have direction. This is x direction. Sorry? I hat is is what we how we refer it's the it's the I unit vector or the X unit vector. Or we say I hat. Don't we don't we say that? Doesn't that uh, sound okay? See the little hat on it? And you can do this in math type when you buy it for a buck and a half. We also need one for the j or the x direction. That's called j hat. So I'll put that on there, and we've got everything we need. 
do me a favor. I notice the students new to this are a little bit sloppy. Make your I look something different than your J. Look down at your paper right now. Make sure your I and your J look a little bit different from each other. That way I'll recognize them. That way you'll recognize them. Either one of these notations is fine. It's just that this one, um, once we take out the R sub X and put in a number and uh, units that go with it, then the direction isn't so clear anymore. In, in this version, the X is what gives us the direction. The Y is what gives us the direction. But if we put values in there, where are the X and the Y? We don't put an X and a Y. Well, I wouldn't write three miles sub X. You might try it, but I wouldn't do it. So we can always put something like, for example, three miles in the I direction plus six miles in the J. And now you know exactly what to do. To get to your little buddy's house, you go three miles in that direction, and then six miles in that direction, and you knock on the front door. And waiting there for you is milk and cookies. Yeah, Joey likes that. That's, that sounds good. Right about now, maybe some warm milk. Be nice. Stewart's hot. Milk. If anybody all of a sudden feels the urge to call mom, go ahead. All right. So, so we're going to use that sum. Um, it's it's also good for us because it helps us when we do these summations over here. We'll only sum out values in the I direction together. We'll only sum values in the J direction together. When we go to add up vectors, we're not going to mix and match those. Yeah, they're, they're added in this way, but that's just the two components being added together. What we're going to do is uh, keep all this stuff uh, separate and it just becomes a bookkeeping problem for us then. As we go to add up all the vectors, we add up all the X ones together, add up all the Y ones together, give them each their proper direction, and we're all done with the problem, just like we showed on Monday. Takes a little practice to get used to, but that's what the homework's for. That's what uh, uh, that's what my full homework solutions are for to help show you how to uh, how we go through this stuff, how you get used to it. For most of you, I assume this I and J. In fact, we'd have a X direction if we did a three-dimensional problem. Then we have a K hat. Uh, for most of you, is that that notation new? I would assume so. But again, it's just a it's just a it's a bookkeeping aid for us. So that we understand when I'm adding certain magnitudes together, I add the X magnitudes together and the Y magnitudes. Remember, I'm not adding three miles to six miles. I'm adding three miles in that direction to six miles in a different direction. And that's a completely different uh, answer then. I don't get nine miles. I get whatever that diagonal across there is, having gone three and then six. All right, so it's going to take some practice. Um, we're going to work through it. Any questions before I clean the board and we get to what we discovered yesterday in lab? No, you're okay, you're comfy. Joe? No. So R sub X just means some X direction. But it doesn't I represent what like what's the difference between X and the I hat? Nothing really. It's just that when I take out the R X and put in three miles, now we need something that says that was three miles in the X direction. Because I'm not gonna write three miles sub X. But if I write three miles in the I direction, you know exactly what I meant. I meant three miles in the X direction. So, 
in, in this form as they show, there's no difference. But once the values come in, then these little subscripts wouldn't be there, and we need something else that represents direction on everything. Samantha? How do you know if it's positive or negative extraction? Depends on the problem. And remember how you set up an arbitrary um, reference, uh, an arbitrary origin. So you won't have negative Sure could. If I have one vector that goes that way for three miles, and then I have another one that comes this way for three miles, I would write this one as three miles I hat. This one is minus three miles I hat. And that shows that they're the same magnitude, measured with the same units, both in the x direction, but one's positive, one's negative, they're in the opposite direction. Why is that direction negative and this one isn't? Who can answer that? Yeah, because I chose the origin. I, I just, we typically say that way is positive, this way is negative. So uh, it's nice to stick with stuff that's typical, if possible. Okay, two good questions. Any others? All right, so let's let's look at what we had in lab yesterday. Now I don't uh, I don't remember if everybody quite got to it, but uh, let's see. Let's. Oh, I want you to do this. As we talk about this, remember we're talking about projectile motion. It's a two-dimensional type of motion. Obviously, there's there's some travel horizontally and there's some travel vertically going on here. Um, so it, it fits really well into the the types of two-dimensional motions we're looking at. But I want you to do this with it as we start to. Uh, to look through what we did yesterday. Put down the middle of your paper, and you can turn your paper sideways if you want a little more room on either side. Put down the middle, no, no, don't do it yet. I didn't tell you what to put down the middle of your paper. Because just a simple line will not do it. It's got to be a semi-permeable membrane. Don't put a line down the middle of your paper. You've got to put down a semi-permeable membrane. Go ahead and do that now. Good joke. Semi-permeable membrane. Do it. Do it. Good. Keep going. Okay. Yeah, you got to go down to the bottom so there's no leakage. We don't want stuff getting through here that doesn't, doesn't, isn't okay to get through here. Get it? Where's your semi-permeable membrane? You must draw exactly I want you to draw semi. A lot of you are just going to put a line down the paper. Joe, weren't you going to do that? But now you got a semi-permeable membrane down the paper. Paper, that's better. Now we can get some work done. Hey, you did a good job, didn't you? You can go to a new sheet of paper if you want. I just said turn it sideways just so you have a little bit of extra room if we need it. So we looked at that video real quick of the guy throwing a projectile across the screen. It just happened to be a softball. Did as good a projectile motion as I possibly, as we could have done in the lab. So that's why it's a lot easier just to use their video, that video there. Picked, crop, picked out of it the position at certain times of that projectile as it went across the screen got a real nice parabola out of it. In fact, it, it looked something like that. Remember? Think back to your past.
most of you did catch that some of these values in here we need to throw out. Why? Sorry? The ball was still in his hand. The ball was still in the guy's hand. Projectile motion is what we call free fall motion. Remember what the definition of free fall is? I gave you a pretty clear definition yesterday of what free fall motion is. It's what we did with uh, the tape drop experiment a week ago and then with the projectile motion yesterday. Sorry? The only force is gravity. The only force is gravity. Uh, yeah, there's air resistance but not a lot. We didn't find a, a huge effect of it. And I don't know if we want to actually run an experiment where there's no air resistance. What it means is I have to pump all the air out of the room. Last time I did that, the administration was very angry. All the dead students. I mean, I, I knew what was going on, so I had, I, had a, I had my scuba tank on. Well, I don't, they didn't call it peculiar. They just said, don't do it again. So, um, gravity is our only force. That, don't forget, is a directional thing. Gravity only occurs downward. Why does gravity only occur downward? Is this an arbitrary question? No, that's not an arbitrary question. Not rhetorical either. That's a straight question. I want an answer. Why does gravity only occur downwards? Because like the center. Exactly. That's where the center of the earth is. It's the earth. It's the, it's the object and the earth in gravitational attraction with each other. If the object's up here and the earth is down there, that's the only pit place, that's the only direction gravity can act. It can only act straight down. That's our first big clue to the nature of projectile motion. The reason things do this. Now, uh, just a point in experimental work, you cannot throw out points that just look bad and you don't like how they look. These weren't just that they didn't <coughs> work right, but we knew why. We knew that when the ball was in the guy's hand, there was more than gravity acting on that ball. His hand was there. In fact, it was, it was getting the thing moving, and it was moving it in a bit of an arc, and all those kind of things are other than gravitational motion. So we knew that those points did not belong as part of the projectile, and that's why we could reject them. If you do an experiment and points show up that you don't like, but you don't know why they don't look right, you can't just throw them out. You have to leave them in. Maybe you discovered something no one else has ever seen before. If you throw them out, you won't get the Nobel Prize. So you got to leave them in. you got to think about them, but you can't just throw them out because they're ugly. Other things in life you can throw out because they're ugly. But, no, you can stay. <laughs> but not dad ones. You can't throw those out just because they're ugly. Alright, so that's that's really important to us because that's our first clue of what's going on here and why this parabolic, parabolic path through space naturally occurred as we threw the ball. So now that we've got this semi-permeable membrane down the middle of the paper, we want to decide what's going on on each side. Why have we done that? What we're going to do is separate the motion of what's going on. We'll put uh, horizontal motion here and the vertical motion 
there. You want to do the other way around? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what's on the left or what's on the right. It does matter that they're separated by this semi-permeable membrane. So we've already established that gravity is the only thing going on here. Once it's out of the guy's hand, gravity is the only thing going on here, and it acts in the vertical direction only. So we know over here the acceleration in the y direction. Now, uh, remind me, I think I did, remind me if I gave you this notation. Y, double dot, did I give you that notation as, as an alternative? I, evidently I did to Samantha and no one else. Did I? No? I think so. No, no. It's, it's, it's just a shorthand notation. Um, anytime we take the time derivative of something, which in this case is the y, so we took the, the, the time derivative of y. I don't want to always write d dt, so I write y dot. Just simply a shorthand notation. So this is, well, if we take the time derivative of the y position, what do we have when we take the time rate of change of the y position? Well, we have the y velocity specifically. So it's just a little shorthand notation for us. What happens when we take the time rate of change of the velocity? We get the acceleration. So if I take d of v in the y direction, dt, or dy dot, because they were the same thing, or, well, y dot's already a ddt, so this is, this is d dt of what's already dy dt. Is that right? You took second derivatives in Calc 1. This is just the second derivative. You used it to find out concavity and all that kind of stuff. For us, it's, well, let's see, I don't want to write all that, so we also shorten it down to that. You've seen that notation from calculus? Uh, in calculus, a lot of times you'd write F double prime. Same thing. It's just F, it doesn't help us a lot. We need to know in here exactly what it is we're taking the derivative of. And I'm too lazy to write that, so I'll write Y double dot. So that's all the double dot means. It's the second derivative with respect to time. So y double dot is the acceleration in the y direction. And we happen to know that that's about minus g. Y minus. Say what? That's the way you chose it to be. That's the way I chose it to be. In this case, we do have an up and a down direction, so it does kind of make sense to pick one or the other as, as a plus or minus. When we did the tape drop, about half of you took down as negative and half of you took down as positive. Didn't matter. Here, we do need to be a little bit more careful, so I'm going to decree, because I'm Lord and High Master here, that down is negative. Just it just sits well for my my aging brain. And and we want to accommodate that as much as we can. Uh, so so I say free fall. You know that means gravity is the only force. That gravity is the only acceleration. We already know this to be true in projectile motion. Gravity is the only force. It acts straight down. What then is the acceleration 
in the horizontal direction. What then is a sub x or x double dot if you'd rather? I don't care which one you use, it's up to you. I recognize both. You should recognize both. Well, let's see. Let's see. Let's look at here's here's the, the data from yesterday. Right? Everybody got something something a little bit like that. Pretty much like that, right? Look pretty familiar, I hope. Notice that for the convenience of the reader, which is you right now, I put that up for your benefit. I adjusted it so the origin on both is right at the first dot. Cut off a couple dots, change the origin so it's right there for the convenience of the reader, which is you. If it starts at some other time, then you have to think, uh oh, did I show up late for the party? Or if it starts at some other height, you have to wonder the height of what? What was that? It, it's immaterial to the reader. Because what's important is the parabolic motion, the projectile motion itself. So I think uh, at least half of you, we, we looked at how to use Excel to very easily adjust that kind of thing. Again, emphasizing that the origin, the location of the origin is arbitrary. It's not going to affect the rest of the physics that's going on. All right, so let's, let's see. Let's see what we have here. Um, we've got, oh, oh, remember this. Remember, uh, we have the constant acceleration equations. Remember those? Did I give you that sheet? Pull it out if you got it. The one I'm most interested in right now, the one that would go with this top graph, actually it would go with either graph, is the third one. Gonna gonna do it in slightly altered form. It's it, the third one is delta y. Remember that's y two minus y one. So I'm just gonna break the y one or or it's y f minus y i. I'm just gonna break y i over to the other side. So I'll write down y f equals one half y double dot. I'm taking out the A and putting in the Y double dot, C squared. Does this look like uh, the third equation so far? Is it the third one? Yeah, I just broke out. Okay, and there it has S. I'm putting in Y because I'm talking about a particular direction. Uh, and, and I've taken out the delta Y, broken it into YF, and I'm going to have yi over here. So let's see. y dot initial t plus yi. Isn't that the third one cast in a particular form illustrating the vertical motion in the y direction? Is that that third equation? Slightly different form, just slightly though. Because that, on that sheet, it's supposed to be for any constant acceleration problem. I'm talking about a vertical constant acceleration problem.
that should give us just the numbers most of you had. Does anybody have their data from yesterday here with them? Sam, Samantha, did you get something like these numbers? Very close? Yeah. Okay. Okay, a little bit different. Uh, you may have had an extra point in there or something is all that that was. All right, so we've got one half. We'll use my numbers just because they're up there for all to see. So it's one half times minus 9.11. Well, there's, there's our estimate of y double dot the acceleration in the x direction. Plus, what else we got in there? 4.22 t. That must be y dot i. What in the world is that? Initial velocity. Yeah, initial velocity. Velocity because it's dot in the y direction. y dot, that's velocity, i, initial velocity in the, in the y direction. Let's see, that must mean right at this point, the initial point of the launch, the, the first point we had where it was out of his hand, because remember we can't count any of the time it was in his hand, there must be some initial velocity in the y direction. Oh, I guess that makes sense. That's why it went up. Because he threw it up a little bit. Makes sense. Why else would it have gone up if he didn't throw it up a little bit? <coughs> You're thinking, after Monday morning after the Super Bowl, I'll tell you what I was thinking about throwing up. Uh, not this class. It was my other class. I had a couple students that didn't show Monday morning. Um, plus, what's the other part there? Oh, a uh, minus point oh oh two eight, and that must be what's y i initial position. Yeah, that's that's pretty darn close to zero. Why isn't it zero? Yet the uncertainty is in the measurement. Remember, I was picking out those data points as the ball went across the screen. Did I hit exactly the same point on the ball every single time? No, of course not. Of course not. But boy, that's pretty darn small. What is that? That's a that's a that's about three centimeters. That's a, a difference of about that. And the guy threw it all the way across the room. So that's not a big deal. We won't worry about that little piece that's so close to zero. But notice we did pick up two pieces of information. The initial velocity in the y direction and the acceleration in the y direction. And it's about what we expected it to be. 9.8, uh, Samantha's was actually a little bit bigger than mine was. But it's certainly in the ballpark. Not quite as high, probably because there's some air resistance going on that's messing some things up. Plus the uncertainties of measurement. Let's look not at the vertical motion. Let's look at the horizontal motion. And that's what that looked like. Doesn't make sense to put a parabola through that. It's pretty darn linear. Yours was too, wasn't it? Once, once you got rid of those first little bits of points that w when it was in the guy's hand, once it was free and in the air and ready to go, that's pretty much what it looked like. Does that look like a constant acceleration situation to you? What do you look for to tell if the acceleration is constant? A straight line that's driven would just be a horizontal line. 
Well, hang on. This is the position versus time. So what's the derivative of that slope give you? What's the derivative? What is the slope of a position time graph give you? Gives you velocity. Is this velocity constant? How do you know? Yeah, it's a nice straight line. The slope is pretty much the same everywhere. If the slope is the velocity and the slope's the same everywhere, the velocity's the same everywhere. So we can say x dot is constant because the slope of our position graph for the x direction looks constant. Agreed? I'm not, I'm not force feeding you anything with that, am I? Tyler, you okay with that? Comfy? Sam, Samantha? Why are your y values repeated? Sorry? Why are your y values repeated? Your position. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Because uh, I, I tossed, what, what happened with those is um, I accidentally left off the first decimal place. I know this now. So this was really zero, well, the pen doesn't work, zero point, worked a minute ago. John, help me out here, pen, please, pencil, please. This is really supposed to be 0 0.5, and it rounded it off. This is 1.0, this is 1.5, that's 2.0, 2.5. I think several times you've heard my frustration with using Excel or any other Microsoft product as we've been going along here in just a few weeks we've been together. This is again one of those frustrations. Oh yeah, that's a lot more clear now. Beautiful. <laughs> that's what the problem was though. Thanks, thanks for catching that. That's, it was just, uh, just simply the fact that uh, it was rounding off. All right. So everybody comfortable that with that position time graph, we are looking at constant velocity. Because the position graph is linear. Position graph is linear. The slope is the same everywhere. The slope is the velocity. The velocity is the same everywhere. If the velocity is constant, what's the acceleration? Zero. Well, that's why there's no uh, one half a t squared value in there. If, if, if did anybody put the parabola through this, what was your a? Wasn't it very very small? Should have been very very close to zero. And I probably came along and said, "Don't do a parabola through that. It's linear data." So. Um, we, we know that the we know that the uh, velocity is constant acceleration is zero. Um, however, is that still a constant acceleration problem? Yeah, it just happens we know what the constant is. It's zero. Zero is a constant. So the constant acceleration equations will still hold. So I'll write down the very same one we had like there. X final equals one half X double dot T squared plus X dot I T plus X I. That's the very same constant acceleration equation in horizontal form. Look at all the y's are gone. There's only x's left. Only x's. Should start to give you an idea of why I wanted this barrier down the middle of the page. There are no y's welcome over here. There are no x's welcome over here. These are two gated communities where Horizontal people do not let the vertical people come to visit. They're not welcome over here. 
The vertical people do not like the horizontal people. They're not welcome to visit over. This is a segregated society and will remain so. No Y's over here, no X's over there. They're not welcome. They can't make it through this barrier. All right, let's, let's look back at this one. Uh, our acceleration is zero, because we have a nice straight line. So that's gone. We didn't even, we didn't even use it. Just by putting a linear fit in there, I was already prepared to say it was zero. So what did we get for a number? Point two nine. I'll just make it point two point nine one t minus zero point zero one seven. Two point nine one what? Well, let's let's look up here. What is it? It's uh, it's x dot means velocity, it's the initial velocity in the x direction. Well, hang on. The velocity is constant. So not only is it the initial velocity, it's the only velocity in the x direction. Because it never changes. It's constant. It's constant slope. So we've got some x velocity that never changes. X dot. I won't even put an I on it because there, there's no I, there's no F, there's no X dot one, two, or three. I have some initial Y velocity at the same instant, I have some x velocity. Add those two vectors together. Because they both happen at the same time and they're both happening to the same object. Notice I didn't add their magnitudes together, I added the vectors together. What is this creature, this vector? Sorry? The resultant, yeah, but that's just the word, that's, that's any two vectors you add together, you get a resultant. What is this resultant? Nope. Nope. I added a velocity vector to a velocity vector. I wouldn't add a velocity vector to an acceleration vector because we don't add things together that don't go together. I wouldn't act to add a position vector to a velocity vector. That doesn't make any sense. I can only add two vectors together that are the same type of vector. A velocity vector plus a velocity vector gives us a velocity vector. What velocity? What is this? Nope. Nope. Let's see. Let's draw a bigger picture. See if we can figure out what we've got. So here's that's that's the 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 screen image we had yesterday. The guy throwing the ball across the screen. We'll ignore the part whether it was in his hand. So we've got that pretty much as our as our uh, screen image, the the video image. How do you get a ball to do something like that? If you throw it straight up, it'll only go straight up and come straight down. If you throw it straight out, it'll only go out and then drop. How do we get it to do this? If I gave you a ball right now and said, throw it so it does that, you do what the guy on the screen did. You take it, you swing your hand back a little bit, and you'd swing your hand forward. You would give it 
a velocity something like that, wouldn't you? A little bit up and a little bit out. Isn't that exactly what you'd do if I asked you to throw a ball across the room? I hope that's what you'd do. No? Is this too athletic for some of you? I'll probably just throw it over again. So that's immaterial. If you wanted to lob like that, you'd still give it a little bit of up. Of course you'd do it overhand because only girls throw underhand. I know what you're thinking. That's what's going through your mind. Yeah. Samantha, if you've got something, you can bounce it off the back of his head. We'll do a little projectile motion right there. Underhand or overhand, I don't care. Isn't this what you'd do to get it to lob across the room? Without even thinking about it, that's what you'd do. And you guys are good at doing stuff without thinking about it. I am. I hardly think about anything I'm doing. This is, well, let's let's see, maybe what, we could even put a little O on it just to remind ourselves that, that that's not constant because the vertical component of that velocity is always changing, but the horizontal component never changes. That's interesting. So we've got this vertical component that never changes. No matter where that ball is, it's got that same vertical component. Why is that? There's no reason it should change. The only way velocity is going to change is if there's some acceleration, and there isn't. So the horizontal part never changes, and that's what we see pretty much here. That's why this line is straight, because the velocity in that direction is almost perfectly constant. Almost perfectly. That was, that's, a, that's a pretty darn good straight line. The vertical component does change. Notice that the slope of this line is getting a little bit less steep as it goes to the top. Well, that's what balls do. They, they, don't, they rise, but they don't keep rising as fast. They slow down until, what's the slope here? Zero. What's the vertical velocity there? Zero, it comes to a stop just for a split second. And then notice the slope starts increasing negatively. It's falling faster and faster and faster as it drops. Starts out with a pretty healthy initial velocity. Loses that until up here it has no vertical velocity. The Earth sucked everything out of it, except it still has that horizontal component. And then it starts to pick up a little bit more vertical velocity as it falls. A little bit hard to draw, especially with sidewalk chalk. But that's the, the deal, what's going on. If I remember in the book, there's a, a nicer picture of this very, very same thing, showing constant horizontal velocity, constant hor vertical acceleration. Actually, it's constant acceleration for both. It's just over here, the horizontal side, the constant happens to be zero. One of my favorite constants. Um, what's that little piece right there? That's, well, we read it right off of here. That's the initial x position. That's really tiny. 
it's about zero too. It's just a consequence then, remember, of, of uh, averaging all these values. It's a little bit of the piece that just happens to be left over. All right, I'm going to clean up here and we're going to summarize some of what we got with, with the rest of the details. So, get to a clean part on your page. <coughs> Leave the semi-permeable membrane there. I started the taper. I did. So we're having fun. We want, we want to remember this forever. All right, so there we are again. Uh, I don't need as much room over here, so I'll leave that little picture up. Uh, the two main things we know, remember. Um, the acceleration in the horizontal direction is zero because that horizontal position graph was a straight line it's not something I'm making up you saw it yesterday if the if the uh, acceleration is zero the velocity is constant I'm not making that up either that's 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 the deal with uh, with derivatives In fact, I can even say a little bit more about what that constant is. Uh, I've got a vector here representing the launch velocity. Whatever its magnitude happens to be. And it's at some launch angle. Hey, if, if we had a cannon, that's what you do. You take that cannon and you point it up at some angle, fire the cannon, give you some launch velocity. We bomb Hudson Valley Community College out of existence. So this constant velocity, we can even cast in terms of the launch velocity. What would it be? It has to do with the magnitude of the launch and the angle of the launch. What's trigonometry? What, what would it give us for this component here on this side if that's the angle we know? Cosine. It'd be V0, what? Equal Not equals. V0 cosine theta. So if I gave you a gun that has a known launch velocity, which any manufacturer of, of artillery or riflery or whatever will tell you what the launch velocity is. You take that gun or cannon or whatever it is, hold it up at a certain angle. It's exactly what you do. And you know then what the launch velocity was in terms of a vector. Its magnitude and its direction. Right there. Oh, hey. Uh, we know we know what that value is. That was the 2.91. Remember that's what came right off. Uh, your numbers might be slightly different. I think Samantha's will certainly be different. Depends on whether you pick the same uh, start point as I did when it was free from his hands. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh, it's constant acceleration. Yeah, constant acceleration happens to even be zero. The constant acceleration equations all apply. They apply for any constant acceleration problem. But if you look at those, every place where A appears in those constant acceleration, everywhere the acceleration appears in those constant acceleration equations, you set A to zero. Three of the equations completely disappear. There's nothing left. Only one of them remains, 
and it's delta x equals x dot t, where t is the amount of time it's in the air. That's all. That's the only constant acceleration equation left. All the rest are gone. Where delta x is how far it travels in the horizontal direction. That's the whole show on that side. Notice x, 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 x. There are no y's over here. They're just not welcome. We're not even going to send them an invitation. They're not welcome here. We've got this, this semi-permeable membrane and y cannot get through that membrane. There's a y here. Come, it's going to bounce right off that. No Y's invited over there. What do we know on the vertical side? Let's summarize that. What's, what's the number one thing that's true about the motion in the vertical direction? What drives everything in the vertical direction? Acceleration is constant and due to gravity. So y double dot equals minus g equals constant. g itself never has a negative sign. That negative sign is only there because I arbitrarily chose it to be. g itself is always considered a positive constant. Because that's not arbitrary. God decided that. And I was there that day. 6,000 years ago. In somewhere in, in the Iran, Iraq area. In the Garden of Eden. It was the first work day. It was Monday. Sunday he rested. Then we got to work. That's the G itself is not arbitrary, but the minus sign is. All right. Uh, since acceleration is constant, then any of the constant acceleration equations apply. Let's see. Let's look at uh, what comes next. Oh, um, the initial y velocity. Since the acceleration is non-zero, then the velocity in the vertical direction is always changing. But it does have an initial value. Whatever it had, that instant it left that guy's hand. There it is right there. There it is in the picture right there. What's it equal to? Here it was in the horizontal direction, the initial velocity in the horizontal direction. What's the initial velocity in the vertical direction? Sine theta. Give me more. Give me the whole thing. Uh, velocity sub zero sine theta. It's the initial launch velocity, but only that part in the vertical direction, which is sine theta. It's not a constant. It's subject to acceleration. In fact, it would be one of the acceleration equations. Oh wait, no, I don't want to do that. Sorry, the initial velocity, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a constant. Because once it leaves its hand, the initial velocity can't change. It's done. It's already there. It's what put the thing in the air. But the velocity from then on changes in a very predictable way, it changes in that way. So we can even write down what it is. A 
as as time goes by the velocity initially decreases vertically because the acceleration is down and then it starts accelerating down because the acceleration is down that in fact is uh, is one of the uh, constant acceleration equations right there on the page. It's just one of those in a slightly different form to fit this problem here, right there. And any of the others. All constant acceleration equations apply. I don't want to write them all down. You've got them there on the sheet. If you don't have that sheet, if you lost it, it looked like you had a quizzical look on your face, or if you missed it that day, I passed it out. No trouble. Go to Angel. Print yourself a new copy. Keep that copy for next year, too, if we have dynamics, if I offer dynamics next year. Because we're using that exact same sheet. All the constant acceleration equations apply. It's just you need to go look at them. Anywhere there was an S, in fact, let me put up your sheet, Joe, if you don't mind. There they are. Anywhere there's an S, put a Y. Anywhere there's a, an A, put a Y double dot or a minus G if you want. Just take those and cast them in the vertical direction. Take out the S's, put in Y's, you got the vertical direction. No X's. No X's allowed. Because they belong over here. They can't cross this membrane either. So anything we need to solve on this side, we'll use the constant acceleration equations, cast in the vertical direction. Anything we need to figure out here? Well, the whole thing's there. There's nothing else to write down. I got the whole thing down there. A little more work to do here just because there's more going on since we have a non-zero acceleration. So here's the big question of the day. I had you put down the middle of your paper a semi-permeable membrane because some stuff can go through that membrane. What can and what cannot? Well, we already know what cannot. No X's, no X dots, no X double dots. No Y dots can go that way. No Y double dots can go that way. Look at, we don't even have a Y in the word. We don't even have an X in the word. We planned that out when when God made the English language. Which was, of course, the first and only language ever really used in the universe. Any American will tell you that. What can go through this membrane? One, two, three holes. And only three things can fit through the membrane from one side to the other. I heard something? Time can. Notice, there's a, there's not that T, uh, that T. Time. Time. It's the same time because those two things are happening at the same instant. Whatever velocity it has at any instant, it's the same one for each instant. So time can go either way. In fact, there will be problems you have to do where Say, say the question is, how far does it go in the x direction? Which you might know is the range. You know, if we're going to shoot uh, Hudson Valley Community College, we need to know how far away it is. So we need to know what the range is. Well, to know what the range is, to, to match it up with our velocity, we need to know the time it's got to be in the air. We may need to find that out from this side of the equation, solve for the time, bring it back through the hole, and then use it here for the for this part of the calculation. That would work okay. 
What can get through the second hole? Huh? Theta. Theta. Yeah, there's there's a theta there and there's a theta there. So theta can make it back and forth as we need. We have a couple problems in uh, this homework set, if I remember, where you have to figure out what the launch angle is. Which is exactly what we have to do, I guess, if we were going to shoot Hudson Valley. We know how far away it is. We know what our, our muzzle velocity is on the gun. We'd have to figure out where we point the dang thing. So we'd have to figure out what theta is. And we need to use it on both sides to make things work. So we'd have to figure out the velocity, make sure that's the right distance, all those kind of things we could do. Um, also, if I remember on those homework problems where you have to find the launch angle, the actual solution of those is a little bit tricky because you, you'll set up the equations on one side and on the other and you've got to solve for theta and it's not a real easy thing to do, but I'll talk about it when, when we get a little farther along with it. How do you solve for things where the algebra just isn't very simple? That's all the... the there, there's solution techniques when the algebra is not simple. You know, you can do quadratic equation and you can do solve for the unknown and all that stuff. Some of the problems are just a little bit more difficult, so I'll give you some tricks and techniques that'll work. One hole left. Okay. Ah, I plugged it. It's what? The launch velocity, the, what, what, if we're talking about uh, artillery or riflery or something is termed the muzzle velocity. This, the, the speed with which it leaves whatever is shooting it, whether it was the speed with which it left that guy's hand or the speed with which a bullet comes out of the, the, the uh, barrel of a gun, uh, whatever it might be. If we were shooting a trebuchet, everybody knows those, uh, shooting. Yeah, what, what do you do? Sling it, whatever. Uh, you know, it, everybody know what a trebuchet is? Boy, it, uh, I mean, that's all anybody builds nowadays. <laughs> the number one project for people with idle time and money. Those three things we need on both sides. The launch velocity occurs at the same instant, the initial instant, and it determines just what the rest of the flight's going to be, as well as the uh, launch angle does. And then, of course, it's all happening at the same time, any, any instant. Just exactly what we found out from our data. So, so I'm not making this up. Everything else I've taught you, I make up as I go along, but not this. Believe that? No, nah, it's in the book. A couple other little things you might know that are all... Oh, by the way, this is good for any projectile motion whatsoever. I don't care what this launch angle looks like. Doesn't matter if it's up, it's straight up, it's straight over or even if it's down, doesn't matter because it just gets fixed, you know, you handle it in here anyway. Doesn't matter if the origin is on the edge of a cliff and we're trying to shoot something below that cliff, doesn't matter because um, we'll have a change in position here from one of the constant acceleration equations. We just, just put the number in and it all works out. So th this isn't particular uh, to, to this projectile motion or to any other projectile motion. This is all true for every single projectile motion problem we could come up with. You just have to get the right pieces in there where they go. Don't forget that some of these, especially over here, have minus signs on them. 
if we're going from a high place to a low place, delta y is probably going to be negative if we set it as such. So make sure that's in there. If we shoot to a higher place, then uh, delta y would probably be positive if you keep that negative sign. I'd suggest you do it so that every projectile motion problem always has the minus sign in there and we never have to fuss with it. But again, it's arbitrary. Some of you are rebels. Any questions before I clear the board and talk about one last little piece? Sometimes there's uh, particular parts of, of either particular parts or particular types of projectile motion that uh, can help you solve a problem if you remember. For example, well, well I guess we've already seen it. Uh, if we had any type of projectile motion. Some launch velocity, doesn't matter if it's pointed up, pointed horizontal, pointed down, or pointed straight up. There is a point at the tippy top where there's no vertical velocity left. It's all been sucked out and nothing extra has been added for the way back down. A lot of the problems ask you something about uh, to what height does the projectile go. Maybe you're asked to find that problem. Even if it keeps going, the problem might say to what height does it go. You need to recognize that at the top, the y velocity is zero. Remember, for any constant acceleration equation, there's three things you know, one thing you don't, to tell you which equation to use. That might be the thing you need to know to find the thing you don't. So even if the projectile keeps going, doesn't mean you can't look at just the part to the top for your part of the, for your, your, uh, uh, you can, you can break the problem into its pieces like that if you need to. And I believe we do have one of, Alan, didn't we have one of those questions you were asking about yesterday? That you need to, you need to remember at that point, we do know something more that may not be expressly said in the problem, may just say at the top. You have to remember at the top we have no vertical velocity. That's what defines the top. Almost done here. One last thing. There's also something extra. There's also extra stuff you can know when you have a symmetric projectile shot. One where it starts and ends at the same height. Whatever launch velocity might give us a nice picture like that. A couple extra things you that might help you in these questions. One is that this peak, this point where there's only horizontal velocity, that point comes. right at the halfway point. That can help if they ask you to find the time in the air and it's easier to find the time to the top, find it and then double it. Or vice versa. Maybe it's easier to find the entire time, cut it in half and you know the time it took to get to the top because it's symmetric. 
Uh, also true not only is the distance half, the time is half. Both of those are true. The, the horizontal distance is half, the time is half to the, to the peak. One other thing that's not quite as obvious. This initial velocity over here is the same initial uh, final velocity over here. The magnitudes are the same and the absolute value of this angle is also the same. That's not as obvious, but it does come from the symmetry of the problem. There's projectile motion. Now you can effectively attack your enemies. So go out there and make SUNY Adirondack proud. HPCC, they're within range. We can get them. It's connected to the community guys. We can get them. We'll leave them alone, though, because they don't have an engineering science program, so they're no threat to us. <laughs> What? Whatever, whatever we need. Now, 